Hello and welcome to Daily Inner Lake News Now. I'm your host, Taylor Edmond. We're taking a look at some of this week's biggest headlines and what's coming up for the Flathead Valley. This week, I chatted with Inner Lake reporter Kate Heston about her first elk hunting trip. Like many other Montana hunters, she and her friends set out on a cold, snowy morning in hopes of seeing some wildlife. But did they end up catching anything? Kate tells us how it went and what she took from the experience. But first, here's some headlines. All four Kalispell City Council incumbents running for re-election on November 7th retained their seats, according to preliminary results. Though a county-level error that saw wrong ballots sent to some Kalispell voters kept victory celebrations muted. Carrie Sue Gabriel, Sam Nunnally, and Ryan Hunter outpaced their respective rivals in the Kalispell City Council's three competitive races. Gabriel topped challenger Wes Walker 482 to 399 to represent Ward 1, while Nunnally beat out Gabriel Dillon 529 to 421 in Ward 2. Hunter won out over Kevin Oreck 605 to 234 in Ward 3. Sid Daoud, who represents Ward 4 on council, ran unopposed. The only other seat up for re-election on the ballot was that of municipal judge. Allison Howard, appointed to the position by council earlier this year, saw no challengers. A mistake deemed an administrative error by county officials meant that ballots mailed out to voters in Kalispell last month appeared to have been issued based on outdated ward boundaries. The Flathead County Election Department, which oversaw some of the polls for the municipality, alerted voters to the problem late Tuesday afternoon but instructed them to continue casting ballots as issued while officials investigated the mishap. County Election Administrator Adrian Chamalik said Wednesday that her office is still looking into the error. The three incumbents seeking re-election to Whitefish City Council hand- handedly retained their seats in Tuesday's municipal election. Frank Sweeney, Stephen Quinnell, and Rebecca Norton accumulated sizable advantages over four challengers. Just over 2,300 ballots were cast in the election. Sweeney was the top vote-getter, earning his fourth term on the council. He described his resounding victory as gratifying and humbling. The election, which he said was was at times messy, with a crowded ballot that included a few candidates that he said, quote, held disqualifying positions. He said the incumbent sweep reiterates the council is on the right path. Whitefish voters on Tuesday also overwhelmingly supported a ballot question about reallocating a portion of the city's resort tax towards housing initiatives. The tally showed 1,773 votes in favor of the tax in question, with just 353 against. Approval of the measure changes the allocation of the resort tax so that 10% is designated specifically for community housing development projects and programs starting February 1, 2025. In the Columbia Falls City Council election, Kelly Hamilton, John Piper, and Catherine Price claimed the three open seats. The Columbia Falls election garnered 875 ballots. Read more local election coverage at dailyinterlake.com. A funding bill containing Congressman Ryan Zinke's proposal to kill Glacier National Park's vehicle reservation system passed the House last week but may not get much further. H.R. 4821, an appropriations bill for the Department of the Interior and Environmental Protection Agency, includes a measure backed by Zinke to starve the vehicle reservation system of funding. It's a move that Zinke, who has been an outspoken critic of the reservation system since returning to Congress, proposed in the summer months. The appropriations bill passed the House 213 to 203 on November 3rd and was sent over to the Senate. However, the White House has already said that President Joe Biden will veto the legislation if it comes before his desk, citing concerns with proposed funding cuts to, the, to federal agencies, particularly the EPA. Zinke has argued that Glacier's vehicle reservation system limits park access to area residents. His provision in the appropriations bill blocks the park from using funds to implement a vehicle rationing system and prioritizes the adoption of a functional shuttle system for visitors, according to a release from his office, but the park doesn't specifically budget for the operation of the vehicle reservation system, according to spokesperson Brandy Burke. The park also has a functional shuttle system, and expanding its capacity has been previously discussed by officials. Burke told the Daily Interlake in July that the reservation system has addressed many aspects of overcrowding in the park, leading to a better visitor experience. She said locals enjoy year-round access to the park. The park's data shows that 27% of all advanced vehicle reservations were obtained by Flathead County residents. Montana's general hunting season is hitting the midway point, and the overall harvest is expected to increase with the onset of deer breeding season, according to state wildlife officials. The deer breeding season, known as rut, typically begins in early to mid-November. The general deer and elk hunting season concludes November 26. So far this season, nearly 4,600 hunters have appeared at regional game check stations. Harvest results at regional check stations are slower than a year ago, while the number of hunters reported is slightly higher. Through the first three weekends of the season, the percentage of hunters in Region 1 with game is 7.1%, compared to 9% in 2022. And that last news story brings us to our deep dive interview this week. I chatted with my coworker Kate Heston. She covers natural resources and politics for the Daily Interlake. 
and she tells us about her first real hunting trip, guided by her friends in Whitefish, who set out looking for elk on a very cold Montana morning. My dad grew up pheasant hunting with, um, he had a Springer Spaniel named Jake, and um, but that was like long before I was I was alive, and um, I've gone on a couple of hikes, never... I've done a lot of hiking, but never in like eight inches of snow in um, snow boots that are too small for me or anything. Um, And so uh, it was a long day for sure, but it was definitely the first day of its kind. And at the end of the day, I got a good workout in, so I'd probably do it again. Um, But yeah, the hunting aspect of it in its own thing was was very interesting, especially um, because we didn't see many deer for a lot of the day, um, which was kind of playing on some of their frustrations, I think. And I think a lot of frustrations that hunters across the valley are having right now. So two of my mutual friends, their names are Reese and Brandon. Um, they both live in Whitefish and are outdoorsmen. And uh, I overheard them discussing that they were going to go do a hike and look for elk at a um, friendly get together. And I knew I needed to do a story for Montana Life and I thought that it would be a really cool story to do visually. And so I asked them if I could tag along and they said, sure, Um, just dress warm. Have you ever done this before? Like it's gonna be early. Like they kind of were giving me all of the red flags and I I was just committed. And so I met them at like five, or I, yeah, I met them at like 5 a.m. in the morning and. Uh, we drove out like an hour to this trailhead um, and we started a really, honestly, really tough four mile hike and with 2000 feet of elevation game, two miles up or two uh, over two miles up and then two miles down. And it, it was definitely a lot, but I learned a lot from them. And it's also cool to see other um, in like young adults uh, who are my age have such different and passionate passions um, in worlds that I'm just now kind of learning about. 2,000 uh, feet of elevation gain in four miles, like in the snow. Yeah. is pretty tough. Yeah, and we started in the dark. Um, one of the guys let me borrow his, he had a camo hat, and it had a flashlight built into it because um, oh. I don't own a headlamp. And <laughs> so I, I, got to, I got to sport that for for a little bit, which was fun. <laughs> Sitting in the woods, hiking in the woods, I'm totally cool with. But, like, making that trek, what were you kind of like? Were you like, is this going to be worth it? <laughs> um, the way up was hard. Uh, and I was sweating, too. And it was strange because it was five degrees. And I'd sweat and then I'd get cold. And so figuring out the layers was difficult. I also didn't want to complain too much or anything because I was with these two people um, who I'm just, like, tagging along on their day. I don't want to... I'm just tagging along. I'm just there to experience it. And so I didn't want to overstep in my complaints. Yeah, you don't want to be a whiner. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't want to whine. But when we got up to the top, we sat up there for 40 minutes. And I was, like, physically shaking by the end of it. Um, And we hadn't seen a single animal. And we saw a game trail, but there was no animals on the game trail. And it was super foggy, so we couldn't see very well. And my toes really hurt. So I was like, are you guys cold? They were like, I mean, yeah, we can probably have better, like, luck at someplace else. And so we started our hike down and then drove around the valley for five more hours. Wow. Yeah. So in your article, you said you stopped at the Olney check station. Yep. Even though you didn't get anything. I'm a newbie to hunting, too. I don't know that much about it. So, But the way I understand it is that you have to stop by the check stations even when you don't get anything, right? Yeah, so they're off the side of – I don't – I think that they're off the side of – highways just in popular hunting spots and there's a sign as you approach them that says all hunters must stop and then there's another sign that you get up to that's a little bit closer and it says if you have game go in this lane if you don't have game go in this lane so we went into the no game line and um the fwp uh man at the check station asked us uh how many people were hunting had we gotten anything had we seen anything um and so they were like, two people are hunting. We saw an elk on the side of the road, but no, not beyond that. Um, and they also had a sign that said uh, the daily count for the animals that were harvested, as well as the um, year-to-date count. Um, and so that was kind of cool just to see. Uh, when we had pulled up, it was, I forget the time. I, I wrote it in the article, but like maybe two. And um, there had already been two two wolves uh 
harvested that day at that location, um, which is just crazy because you kind of see the variance of some people having success and some people not. How did you guys find success? Where did you find success? Yeah, so it was around sunset, and we were just – I know I never – I never realized the like the secrecy that is involved in like telling people where you hunt um, until I wrote this story, and I don't think I gave too much away, which is good. But, I don't think um, you did either. <laughs> but uh, we were just around um, the flathead uh, on the northern, like north, or I know that we were north in the flathead, and um, it was around sunset. And one of the boys I was with said that. Uh, this was the perfect time. This is like normally when animals start coming out, you'll see more action because we didn't see anything. Uh, and we drove around in different forests um, and on different back roads for probably it was until sunset. Um, and we only saw stuff the last hour uh, or the last like two hours. So then we just started kind of doing another little hike and because it was getting late and it was almost kind of like a last ditch attempt to get something. And we ended up walking up on a, a a group of, there was like four, I think two of them were does, two of them were bucks. Um, I don't remember if one of them ran. I, again, I wasn't looking specifically, but they each shot and they each got an animal. Um, and there was just like this instantaneous, I heard a high five. I heard them yeah. saying like, yeah, bro, that's awesome. Like <laughs> nice shot, bro. So I think that, I think that they were happy about it. Um, and I spoke with one of them, uh, this week and they said that they got, got a sausage making setup at Cabela's and that they're like just finished processing all of the meat that they got. Um, which yeah, that's a whole other world. That, that's a whole other sort of foreign concept to me but um yeah it was really cool to see kind of this activity from start to finish I'm from Kentucky so my family does hunt and I've been out with my dad on a few excursions and things like that um but um one thing that he always drove home to me is that it's really important um talk about like it being important to the culture it used to be the way that people really sustained themselves especially through mm -hmm. the winter here mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's kind of a cool aspect of it and why it was so cool that you got to take part of it because yeah. it's also a big part of your beat. And mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I, I write about hunting a lot, so it was cool to actually see it yeah. um, beyond just reports or written word. Yeah, like see it live in action mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Um, and it does take a lot of work, yeah, because it's, again, waking up so early and then, yeah, if you have to quarter – and, and do all that that night it does it takes like way you know about 20 hours it yeah could, you know? yeah it's combined it's a com and different animals take long like you get a moose you might be there for 48 sort right. of thing so let's see what events are coming up tomorrow is veterans day don't miss the chance to honor local veterans at various events happening throughout the region in particular kalispell's veterans day ceremony starts at 11 a.m in depot park downtown It'll be followed by a luncheon at VFW Post 2252 in Kalispell. At noon on Saturday as well, VFW Post 4042 in Big Fork will host a spaghetti lunch. Join the Western Montana Musicians Cooperative on Saturday, November 11th in Ronan for a day filled with music, camaraderie, and community spirit. Celebrate four years of musical collaboration, growth, and harmony and help them continue their mission of supporting musicians in Western Montana. Festivities will run 3 to 10 p.m. with a jam session to follow. There will be a $5 door charge for admission, and attendees can enjoy beer, wine, and food. And the Kalispell Senior Center will be holding an informative presentation on hospice care with Tracy Kennedy on November 13th at 1 p.m. It is free to attend and open to the public. The Kalispell Senior Center is located at 40 11th Street West, Suite 110 in Kalispell. Thanks for joining us. News Now is a podcast from the Daily Interlake. We're proud to be the largest independent newsroom in Montana and the oldest paper in the Valley. Consider becoming a subscriber to support our work. Call Circulation at 406-755-7018 or go to the Subscribe tab in the top right corner of our website. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel to never miss an episode of The Pod. Everybody stay safe and have a great week.